My name is Susan Smalian. I'm a professor of American Studies at Brown, and I direct the Center for Public Humanities here. Um, and just let me say a word about that. The Center for Public Humanities has a two-year <coughs> master's program, um, and I, um, it, we take about 10 students a year. We have some significant funding for them, um, especially for a fellowship in the study, uh, a graduate fellowship in the study in the, of the history, public history of slavery uh, that we do jointly with our colleagues at the Center for Slavery and Justice. Um, there are a bunch of our students around, not, the, not least of which is the fabulous Shana Weinberg, um, who's a graduate. Um, are the other students from Public Humanities in the audience, raise your hands. Yeah, Andrea's here. So we're glad to answer questions. And so oh, and oh yes, Alan is up. Thank you, Alan. And Alan is also Alan Cook uh, is also an alum. Um, so we're glad to answer questions. We hope you'll send students you know uh, who want to um, think through some of the issues we've been talking about all weekend uh, and end up with a master's degree um, uh, to our program. We're, and as I said, please come and let us know if you have questions. Um, so I, I'm, I was trying to think of the ways in which um, these papers come together uh, because it struck me, and Tony's not here so I can't tweak him, uh, that we're the only um, uh, group that doesn't have, well the public humanities, the digital humanities projects didn't have a, we don't have a little write up. So I worked um, pretty hard to think of things that connected um, the papers. And for me, there are two um, ways to bring these papers together. I, I, I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of the local in the national and the global, um, and the idea of citizen historians. Um, and, and let me just talk for a second about that. Um, I, my center, like the Gilda Lerman Center at Yale and Brown Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, work hard to think through what happens how what happens locally teaches us and how we can support it. Um, most of the projects, memorials, museums we've heard about up until now at the conference are in some very st strong ways local. They come to this conference from places around the world, but they draw their own understandings from their communities and have generously shared those understandings with us. Um, for me, the first iteration of public history involved scholars finding an interesting topic or an interesting set of documents analyzing and writing about it and then looking for a wider audience. Now I hope scholars more often try to work in collaboration uh, to see what questions people have and we think about how to make sense of them, those questions, using a range of different kinds of knowledge. Um, for me, the digital has made this all easier. Um, I heard someone say yesterday that the digital was just another tool and I guess I disagree about that. For me, it's been a new way of thinking about collaboration. As my colleague Monica Martinez says, about user testing or crowdsourcing. And when you do that, now we're into the memory uh, part of what uh, Professor Bogues talked about. This is how most people think about and use history. And when we put things up online, we hear right away what people think and how they think about it. And I argue for doing that kind of finding out before we put something up online. Um, I, my colleague Elizabeth Francis at the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities talks a lot about citizen historians uh, and thinking, or citizen humanists, and thinking about how we can work to support them. Those of you who aren't burdened by a PhD in history, um, in some ways um, are, are, have a, a different set of interests. And I wouldn't uh, romanticize my work with uh, citizen historians. It's, it, it's hard work, because we think about history uh, very differently. And I've learned a lot, uh, but I've had a lot of fights. Um, and so I, I want to say, um, and then I just, the, the last I want to do is uh, do a shout out. Um, because we're in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, I want to mention a few ways that the people here think about and use history. We've heard a lot about how Brown has faced its past, but I want to honor this place where we've come together in hopes that some of what's happening off what we call College Hill might connect to what you are thinking about or remembering in your own communities. So um, I have a couple of shout outs. Um, our, co our colleague and uh, current student in the 
Public Humanities Program, Marjorie O'Toole is the Executive Director of the Little Compton Historical Society, and you may have had a chance to meet her yesterday. Um, she's done this wonderful exhibit on slavery in Little Compton, where Little Compton is about the whitest and richest part of Rhode Island. And she's uh, found, found, tracked down and found the names and histories of 200 enslaved Africans, um, 250, I think, and has built a wonderful exhibit around them. I don't want to forget um, the role of the arts as we think through this history. So our colleagues at the Everett Dance Theater have done an amazing production um, uh, around their interest in mass incarceration, and they call it the Freedom Project. And then I have to mention a wonderful set of youth arts programs. Uh, City Arts for the Little Kids, AS220 Youth, who work with um, kids uh, transitioning out of the correctional facility um, that the people in Rhode Island called the Training School. And then the place where my heart is is a place called New Urban Arts, where I'll dash out for a minute uh, to go to their Christmas sale. Um, these are three, um, you, three groups that empower young people to think about the same issues we've been talking about today. They do it through art, um, but they get really quickly to the history, and they have no uh, trouble talking about the implications of what we do. Um, they talk about issues of racial and gender hierarchy and violence, um, and they do it in really interesting ways. And then you can't forget the people who are working in the schools, particularly the Providence Student Union, which has worked so long and so hard and so successfully in getting ethnic studies um, into the Providence high schools. So in Providence, we join you in this important work, and I want to now uh, turn to my colleagues on the panel um, who will tell um, uh, the stories of their their own projects. Um, let me introduce them to you, and we'll go um, from the farthest from me to the closest. I never do right to left. I, I don't know it <laughs> when I'm facing you, and I wouldn't know it if they're turning around. So maybe, Sandra, you would raise your hand. So our friend, <laughs> Sandra Arnold, is the founder and director of the Periwinkle Initiative. The initiative's core project is the National Burial Database of Enslaved Americans. This will be the first national repository to document burials and burial grounds of those formerly enslaved in the United States. And because I know Sandra and have heard about this, I'm very interested in the ways in which this is both local and national at the same time. Sandra is a public historian from rural Tennessee, where members of her family were once enslaved. She earned her BA in history from Fordham and is an MA in public humanities student at Brown. <coughs> And we're proud that she's the graduate fellow uh, for the study of the public history of slavery at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, next to Sandra is the Reverend Canon Linda L. Grenz, Canon to the Ordinary of the Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island. We've uh, now um, established that um, for those of us in the academy, the Canon to the Ordinary is the provost of the Episcopal <laughs> Diocese. Um, uh, 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 I'm just going to say Linda. Linda has a Master's of Theological <laughs> Studies degree uh, from Harvard Divinity School, a Master of Divinity from the Episcopal Divinity School, and a Doctor of Ministry degree from Drew University. I insisted on telling everybody's credentials, not because I think they make them um, somehow more important, but be for the students in the audience to figure out how people get to the jobs they have. Um, so the Center for Reconciliation is currently in its initial startup stage and is envisioned as a teaching museum that explores the intersection of faith in the slave trade through performances, lectures, and educational experiences. The Center for Reconciliation will be based at the Cathedral of St. John, not very far away, and will collaborate with many local and national partners. And then finally, Emily Kugler is assistant professor in the English department of Howard University. She holds doctorate and master's degrees from the UC, from University of California, San Diego, and a bachelor's from Scripps. She's written a book, Sway of the Ottoman Empire on the English Identity in the Long 18th Century, and is currently working on new digital and book projects focused on networks, women, slavery, and empire. She was very busy um, working extensively with the 2015 Middle Passage Port Marker Ceremony uh, to recognize Boston's role in chattel slavery in the Americas, um, including co-authoring and managing the event website, which I recommend to you, bostonmiddlepassage.org. And she's on the advisory board of the national organization, the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project, and I hope she'll uh, talk to us about that. Um, so I won't keep you with my uh, thoughts any longer, but um, let Sandra tell us hers, um, and um, thanks. Okay. 
Well, first of all, I just want to start out by saying I'm really happy to be here um, as a student in the public humanities program here at Brown and uh, a fellow at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, I'm honored to, uh, to be here. I'm honored that I was asked to participate. And I want to thank Dr. Bogues, uh, Dr. Blythe, uh, Maya, Shana, everyone at the Gilder Lemon, Gilder Lemon Center, and also CSSJ for, for allowing me to be here. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm here to give a brief snapshot of the Periwinkle Initiative, which, is a, uh, which aims to create a national repository for burials and burial grounds of formerly enslaved Americans. Uh, much of what I'm going to share with you actually is on uh, a report that I recently completed. It's online on the project's website, and at the end of my presentation, um, I'll share the link and you can uh, view uh, the report and um, learn more details about, about the work. Um, however, before I share details about the project, uh, I'd like to begin by introducing you to two members of my family who are actually the true founders of uh, the Periwinkle Initiative. Um, this is my Aunt Elsie <laughs> May Fry. Um, she, uh, re she passed away just a couple, of, uh, couple years ago at 101. Uh, her father was uh, born a slave. Uh, she's my grandmother's sister. Uh, and um, I could do an entire presentation on her. Um, <laughs> she was a spitfire. She loved to hunt, fish. Uh, she's a survivor of Jim Crow. Um, and she's actually the catalyst for my work. Um, her example of how she um, took care of his grave and the uh, cemetery where he's buried, he's buried in a plantation cemetery, uh, moved me and inspired me. Uh, for some reason, uh, I didn't understand it at the time, but she treated the uh, site like it was a jewel. And of course, you know, it's her father. That part wasn't necessarily shocking. Um, but this cemetery is actually a cemetery that holds the graves and resting places of the plantation owner and his family. And um, for whatever reason, I'm not really sure, um, they buried the slaves, uh, their enslaved community, in the same cemetery uh, with their family. So it was important to her that the entire site was respected and that the entire site was preserved. And uh, watching how she took care of the site um, was just an education to me. And again, I, 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 quite, I didn't quite understand all of it at, at the time, and I'm still learning a lot. But uh, I'm so proud um, of her and her work. And this is her father, my great-grandfather, uh, Ben Harmon. Um, he was uh, born a slave, lived most of his early life enslaved in West Tennessee. Um, this is the only photo he ever took in his entire life. Um, I look at this photo often, particularly when I'm emotionally and mentally tired, uh, discouraged, and need to be reminded of, of what really matters. Uh, he is my motivator. What I have come to love most about uh, my grandpa Ben is that he is simply how he is remembered by others, uh, which is not b by his enslavement. That's not how, how most people remember him. He's remembered as a, gentle, a, man, a gentleman, a man who's very gentle, uh, who was very protective of who courted his daughters. And he loved playing with his grandchildren. He didn't speak unkindly about anyone. And he played a mean fiddle. And he was a skilled craftsman. He was known throughout the community for his handcrafted chairs. So in other words, to those who knew him, in other words, to those who knew him, he was simply a man. And their, their memories humanized him to me. And that is what I strive to keep at the heart of the Periwinkle Initiative, which is restoring the humanity of the public memory of the enslaved. Uh, my work started a few years after I visited my great-grandfather's grave uh, for the first time. He's buried, as I stated, in a former uh, plantation cemetery. Um, I think this is another photo of it. Um, and although he has a headstone, uh, many graves next to him do not. They are in unmarked graves belonging to people who have been enslaved on this particular plantation. He was not enslaved on this plantation. Uh, his, my great-grandmother, his wife, her family was enslaved on this particular plantation. So on the photo to the right, uh, we're standing kind of at or his grave, and you can see across the way, which is kind of hard in that photo, but there's 
you can see the descendants of the plantation on their, their graves. But that entire vacant space there is uh, unmarked slave graves. So obviously, um, when I discovered the site, um, what became in interesting to me and what I became inquisitive about is who are these people buried in the unmarked section? So I started exploring uh, this cemetery and others like it in the region. Um, and actually, uh, they included four presidential estates. And what I became aware of is that there was a widespread documentation and preservation problem that exceeded the lack of grave markers. Uh, cemeteries and graves of the formerly enslaved were devalued uh, and forgotten by the communities in which they were located. Consequently, the sites were abandoned, they were paved over, covered by buildings, and most of them, not all, but a lot of them were void of any type of preservation or protection efforts. And this all began when I was a history student at Fordham University, and I approached uh, certain faculty members about the idea of creating a national database to not only document the sites, but to make this database free and accessible online uh, for people to do public research, whether that's historians or people doing genealogy. Uh, shortly after, I began assembling an advisory committee of scholars and experts and professionals. And in 2013, uh, we launched the Burial Database Project of Enslaved Americans at Fordham University with the intent of developing a national repository. However, for me, the launch was kind of like a test pilot. Uh, I knew from the beginning that it would be impossible to create such a database without the help of the general public. Uh, they hold the location of these sites in their churches, cities, communities, and backyards, which some of them have been submitted to our project, are actually located literally in people's backyards on, on their property. Therefore, their partnership and engagement was crucial to the success of the project. I also knew that slavery is still a very sensitive and divisive subject in our country, and I wasn't certain if the public would support or assist with the work. However, with, again, however, with, uh, with no funding, little funding, or an official outreach component, we moved forward and launched a website uh, with a basic call to help us document, the bur document burial grounds of enslaved Americans. And again, this was done without funding, and the only source of promotion for the project at the time was media coverage that Fordham had secured uh, in various uh, newspapers. Um, and the response was actually very, very encouraging. Uh, if you look at the numbers here, um, you might think these numbers are not very impressive considering the millions of people who were enslaved in the United States. But keep in mind, this was accomplished without a formal outreach or promotional campaign, which is something we uh, hope to do when we actually launch the, the real database, the national database. Uh, we want to have a, a real um, thorough outreach component to, to, uh, to the database. Uh, submissions from the public, public, the 359 burial grounds and cemeteries and graveyards, over 11,000 individual graves, and of the burial grounds that were submitted, at least 31 were, on a, were actually on a uh, historical register. Um, there were a lot of uh, lessons that I learned that I didn't expect from the project. Again, when I started the project, the goal was simply to create a, a database to document the sites. But, um, you know, I became aware of a lot of things that I, I felt that it was impossible for us to turn a blind eye to or just not really get involved in. They were actually crucial to the documentation of the sites. Uh, some of the lessons were we became very aware of local and regional efforts to save uh, and preserve uh, burial grounds. There were people already doing this work in local communities, but they were struggling. Uh, a lot of them, weren't, they just weren't aware of his resources to help them. And, uh, and the, so they were calling us, I call it most, mostly me, uh, <laughs> and emailing me for help. And I wasn't necessarily prepared to um, answer their questions. Um, but um, I was able to kind of steer them in, in the right direction. But it was also very encouraging to me to be connected with uh, kind of a village of workers. Um, also an accomplishment that I'm very excited about that we were able to kind of uh, have with the project. Uh, we were awarded a chairman's grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and we used this award to secure uh, Second Story, which is a pioneering interactive design agency, and they're gonna work 
with us to continue uh, building the database. Um, we've already um, worked on the design, the framework, and the interface of the database, and we just are just really kind of moving into a stage of, of, of implementation. Um, and I think what was really important for me uh, about hiring or bringing on Second Story is I wanted, it was important for me for the database to be a site that was engaging and um, that wasn't the stale space online with information and, and not to, uh, you know, uh, knock other databases, um, but it was important to me that this was a site that, that evoked reverence and that when people uh, came to the site, it humanized the experience of, of enslaved Americans. Um, I also became aware <laughs> that documentation alone was, was not the only thing that needed to be addressed uh, affecting the sites. Uh, this is a site that was submitted to us. Um, for example, uh, this, these are photos of the East End Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. There's very little in these photos that would indicate that this is a sacred space. It is a historic 16-acre African-American burial ground founded in 1897. It contains the resting places of formerly enslaved and free African-Americans. However, today, uh, the cemetery is an illegal trash dump. Uh, there have been some citizens in the area that have been working to, to actually get involved and, 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 and really restore this site. But, you know, concerned citizens indicated many additional challenges facing burial grounds in their communities. Um, they were often um, really distressing things. They inquired a lot about how to save a site from being de desecrated by a development or construction project, um, how to reinter remains. So someone actually asked us, how do we, there's, there's a, a developer who's gonna remove remains that we don't want them removed, how do we, prevent this? I mean, all these different questions, again, that we, I wasn't necessarily prepared uh, to answer. So I also get a, a lot of questions about why a national data database. So when I started the project, the end goal was always uh, the creation of a publicly accessible national database. Uh, so a lot of questions I hear in addition to why a national database is, uh, the main question I hear a lot is, doesn't something like this already exist somewhere? <laughs> Uh, that's the, that's the, if I had a, if I had, I would have the whole project funded by now if, if I had, <laughs> but, um, but people assume that it exists somewhere, and then they're, and they're shocked that it, that it has not been done and that it, and that it hasn't, that, you know, that it doesn't exist. And then secondly, the other question is why the Periwinkle? Why, why is your project called the Periwinkle Initiative? It's called Periwinkle uh, um, because of uh, the flower. Uh, there's a scholar, uh, Dr. Lynn Rainville, who has been working on burial grounds of enslaved Americans for many years. Um, she told me and, uh, that in her work, um, they've actually gone to sites where they could not find where the enslaved people were buried. They were able to find uh, where the plantation owner was buried. They know slaves are there and they just haven't been able to find them. And for some reason, um, when they <laughs> look for these periwinkle flowers, there they are. So she, she, they believe that it's possible that in this particular region, I don't know if this was a practice throughout the country, but that periwinkles, um, they grow in the wild, they're perennial, you know, so they, they keep growing back. So it's a very inexpensive way, obviously, to mark a grave. And so a lot of them believe that that's what a lot of uh, enslaved people uh, did. So I named my work the Periwinkle in Initiative. Um, and then uh, the questions about why is it necessary? Um, due to certain fundamental components of chattel slavery, such as little regard for the humanity of the enslaved and the separation of families through sales, uh, auctions, etc., cultural heritage associated with enslaved Americans has challenges that make it difficult to establish identity or a historical record of an individual. So these factors possibly explain why many from this period like they lack official birth records or, de or death records. Hey, Sandra, mm -hmm. we're almost out of time. Okay, great, so I'll, I'll finish up. Um, so um, my, um, so these are some of the factors that, uh, of why a database, a national database is important. Um, and also, um, 
Since I began the work in closing, uh, it seems that burial grounds and graves are being found in increasing numbers, and the stories of how they are discovered are painful because they are in the most irreverent conditions and places. So these are some of the media stories that are, that have, a few that have been printed about them. Um, I want to be among those who seek to pave ways to rescue these sites and shape uh, a dignified public memory for enslaved Americans. Um, earlier, I mentioned that restoring the humanity of the enslaved is the impulse of the Periwinkle Initiative, and I believe this restoration can be accomplished partly by reclaiming and cherishing the resting places of the enslaved. Uh, to many, a grave may seem like a bleak reminder of a life lived, but they are not. Uh, these spaces, meaning cemeteries and burials, are by nature saturated with humanity, and so are those who are buried there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to share with you the story of the Center for Reconciliation launched by the Episcopal Diocese of Rhode Island. Our place in this august conference is a bit unusual as we are a grassroots effort largely led by volunteers, only some of whom are professionals in the field. Most of us are members of the Episcopal Church and it is our faith that motivates us to do the work of racial reconciliation. We understand reconciliation as the core mission of the church, and as members of the church, we're called to be actively involved in the spiritual practice of reconciliation. But I want to focus our attention today on how a specific community, in this case a faith community, engages its members and the public in a conversation about slavery and its legacies. Our story begins with our denomination, which adopted a series of resolutions that acknowledge the Episcopal Church's history of participation in and support of the slave trade and the deep and lasting injury which the institution of slavery and its aftermath have inflicted on the church and on a society, especially on the people of African descent. When our new bishop arrived in Rhode Island in the fall of 2012, it was right after the diocese had closed the historic St. John's Cathedral in Providence due to the condition of the building. Now, we had a building in need of repairs and no congregation. So we have hosted a series of charrettes around the state to ask, what should we do with the cathedral? One of the ideas that was proposed was a vision for creating a place and programs that would enable our church and the citizens of Rhode Island to look at our unique place in the history of slavery and the slave trade. And that vision was overwhelmingly infirm, affirmed by our diocesan convention in November of 2014. While no one really knew what it meant at the time, I think it sounded sort of like a good idea to people, to be honest. To our amazement, the idea was immediately picked up by news media across the country and around the world. Um, we were fielding requests from the New York Times, television stations, and even German newspapers. Somehow, the concept of a slave museum in a church obviously was newsworthy. Unfortunately, it was also a little bit of a misnomer because we never envisioned having a traditional museum since we have no artifacts, well, except for one courier and an Ives imprint. We have no climate-controlled environment, guards, guides, or any of the rest of the things that would enable us to have a regular full museum experience. Plus, the idea of a slave museum in a church misses the most important concept of the Center for Reconciliation, namely that we envisioned the cathedral as a place where people could talk about slavery, the slave trade, and its legacies open and honest dialogue about difficult topics like race is what we see as being at the heart of reconciliation. So one of the questions that arose early on is, why do this work here in Rhode Island and what's the church's role in it? So while we usually think of slavery as a southern institution, Rhode Island was, of all the northern states, the most deeply involved in both the slave trade and in supporting the institution of slavery. As most of you probably know, about 60% of slaves brought to America were transported on ships that were launched from Providence, Bristol, and Newport, Rhode Island. 
Most of our state's economy was built on revenues generated by slavery in the slave trade and later by profiting from southern slavery in the processing of cotton textiles and the production of Negro cloth for sale to southern slave owners. Yet many Rhode Islanders remain unaware of our colonial history of slavery and slave trading and our dependence on the southern slavery from the revolution to the Civil War. And there are, frankly, few places in the state where people can encounter and explore this history. While other faith communities were, of course, involved in the slave trade and its auxiliary businesses, many of the leading businessmen engaged in the slave business were Anglicans, now known as Episcopalians, the shipping industry, rum distilleries, dairy factories, banks, insurance companies, textile mills, and more were owned by Anglicans, and the wealth they acquired built our churches, schools, and communities. While some of our members spoke out against slavery, many others, including our clergy, owned slaves and benefited from the business of slavery. While many would prefer to ignore this history, we believe we have a unique opportunity to model a different response. We can create an environment in which we can learn to confront this history, own it, learn from it, and begin the long and difficult task of healing and reconciliation. While slavery occurred in the past, its legacies are painfully present today. Many of the negative attitudes and assumptions about blacks that were used to justify slavery continue to influence impressions of people of color today. And it is the remaining impact of racism and discrimination that we are called to address. We believe that connecting to our past will enable us to build a more diverse and inclusive future. And given the rise in racist and hateful incidents after the recent election, there is an urgent need to provide safe spaces where people can hear each other's stories, build relationships, and work together to build a more equitable and just future. The repurposed St. John's Cathedral is ideally suited to become a multifunctional facility that provides a broad range of learning experiences, lectures, training events, videos, performances, art, and historical exhibits. Our commitment is that each event is rooted in historical truth and provides an opportunity for dialogue and building relationships. Our vision then is to provide safe space wherein those difficult conversations about slavery and its legacy can occur so that our society can begin a transformative healing process. We won't be doing that work alone, but are partnering with organizations, both faith-based and secular. We want to open multiple doors to invite people into dialogue using a wide range of entry points, performances, exhibits, films, study groups, lectures, and more. Cathedrals have traditionally been sites that intersect the sacred and the secular, a venue for excellence in liturgy and the performing and visual arts, and a place to explore current events. Cathedrals have also provided sanctuary from the world, a safe space for healing and restoration. The vision is for St. John's Cathedral to become that place for the diocese, for the state, and even for people who will visit from elsewhere. We're still in the early stages of development. Our building is still closed and just beginning in renovations. And by the way, I'll take any advice on how to get money to restore a historic building. I have no idea how we're going to do that. So anybody who's got ideas, speak to me. But we're already doing programs around the state. And we're developing resources that will empower people to begin those important conversations. We're building partnerships with organizations and institutions that can provide artifacts or content, like our slavery walking tours that include visit to its historic homes on College Hill, our recent Race of the Art event with Rhode Island School of Design where artist historians and our staff shared in a conversation about race-related art that they have in their archives and is otherwise not shown, or the Martin Luther King Day celebration that engages a dozen organizations and this year will feature readings, reflections, and music around the six steps King outlined as leading to reconciliation and building the beloved community. And we have a cemetery project that's working on, I'll introduce you to Deke and Ricky. Um, we're looking for slaves who are buried in our churchyards and civic cemeteries and in people's backyards. The facilitators were training to use James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, to invite people into a book study group. And our presence here today is due to our relationship with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, thanks to Tony Bogues, who is, serves on our board. So there are several roles that shape our unique place in this conversation. One is that we come up from the perspective of faith community. 
As such, we have an opportunity to be both a moral voice in the community and to invite people to find their own moral voice in this dialogue. And we have the practice of spiritual reconciliation that we can offer to the larger community. We have, or eventually will have, space, but no content. Rhode Island has dozens of historic societies, preservation groups, and individuals with artifacts, but no place to display them. In addition, contemporary artists of color, especially black artists, also have difficulty finding exhibit space in this state. We can bring groups together and provide exhibit space, facilitate dialogue about those objects. Third, the church has traditionally filled the role of convener, and we see ourselves as fulfilling that role in the community, being a neutral party who can invite disparate groups who otherwise might not intersect into a collaborative effort, like the Martin Luther King celebration that I mentioned earlier. The church has often been a convener of the community in times of crisis, and so we also want the cathedral to be a place where we can gather the community for conversation when those times of crisis arise. We're not going to have a big facility or valuable objects or host major conferences like this one. Our focus is on collaborating, convening, and engaging people in dialogue. We see our role as creating that safe space where people can confront painful truths, share stories with each other, build bridges that enable them to work together to make a difference in addressing the challenges of slavery and oppression today. I want to just mention quickly a quick shout out to members of our board, Bishop Nisley, who's up in the back, uh, Morgan Grief from the Rhode Highland Historical Society, and Tony Bogues, who are all on our board, and Alan Cook is our part-time staff person. We've got some of our volunteers here, um, David Ames, Del Glover, and Pam McDonald. If you stick your hands up, so if people are interested in looking <laughs> and talking, most of those folks are up that way. Please talk to us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to add into some of the thanks that Sandra gave. Um, for the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project, which I'm going to discuss today, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice has been instrumental not just in Rhode Island, but in helping construct one of the maps that we'll see, helping us connect to faculty who can work with researchers. And personally, um, going to a brown bag talk at the center was how I became involved in this project. So. I'm going to say thank you for that. <laughs> I really, it meant a lot to me, um, and it meant a lot to the project. Founded in 2011, the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project is an international grassroots organization dedicated to commemorating the more than 2 million who perished in the Middle Passage and the 10 million who survived, partnering with historical and cultural societies, academic institutions, churches, visitors, and tourist bureaus, the National Park Service and community organization, the project aims to research, identify, and facil facilitate remembrance ceremonies at all ports of entry for captive Africans during the 350 years of the transatlantic human trade in North, Central, and South America, the Caribbean, and Europe. This is an organization that is very grassroots. Um, I recently moved to Washington, D.C., and I've learned that nonprofit can mean a lot of different things. We are very nonprofit, and we are volunteer run, <laughs> and, um, and so we work with local institutions, local historical societies. Um, we rely greatly on the rich knowledge that we find in these sites that we go to. The organization was founded by Ann Chin. The executive board, which you can look at our website, millpassageproject.org, includes people such as Charlie Cobb. Um, but again, at the local level, it is the people who are there. We are trying to make each ceremony and each marker fit into a larger national and global story, but it's very important to us that it fits that community's history, that community's unique story. I want to take a moment and say the people in Rhode Island who are working in the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project, can you briefly just, just wave your hand? Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so good to see you. And you've all been part of my, some of my biggest highlights of 2016, so I really appreciate that. Um, so while there are guidelines for the project, sites need to produce ceremonies and markers that address their specific local histories. 
I became involved when I heard Ann Chin speak here at Brown, and she mentioned that there was a Boston ceremony coming up. And as someone interested in learning more and also telling more people about the history of enslavement in New England, I asked what I could do. Um, so I worked with the ceremony there, and then I became a liaison for the national organization working with in Rhode Island. What's unique about what's happening in Rhode Island right now is that for the first time, four sites are trying to work together concurrently throughout the state, trying to create, create a statewide story that helps bring in all the excellent research that's already been done and produce new research going forward with this history. Part of the original concept for this project was that of a second burial. The idea that while a first burial shortly after the death addresses the immediate concerns of the body, the spirit of the deceased and those mourning that person require a second ritual. The project often views its remembrance ceremonies as a means of enabling that communities mourn, recognize, and honor these ancestors. I'm just going to go quickly through. The project frames the history of the Middle Passage as a means of recognizing the vital role of enslaved people and their descendants, and their descendants played in the building of these port sites, colonies, states, and the nation. The project's commitment to promoting and helping disseminate research on the lives of Middle Passage survivors and their descendants is a key aspect of this. Locating port sites relies on contacts within local communities, as well as on resources such as the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. Mapping of these sites points to just how this isn't just a southern history or one of Spanish America or one of the colonies. It is a deeply American history, foundational to the origins of the United States and the colonization of the Americas. And I think this is our most recent map. And what I love about that is that we have it going all the way from Maine into Galveston, Texas. Um, these are different dates different histories, but one of the things that we've discovered as we do in more and more research is that almost any port in the era of the Middle Passage has a possibility of being a Middle Passage port. This map, which is also on our website, identified sites, notes whether or not they've had a ceremony, a marker, or both. Markers and ceremonies do not have to have been initiated by the project, nor do we have to have been involved. Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire is an example of an amazing memorial to their African burying ground that later contacted the project right before they had their ceremony and asked to be included on the map, and we did. Um, the, um, the map says as a resource, a visualization for linking multiple local histories together. The term descendant community, which I've used throughout this talk, um, usually refers to the root, those with roots in the African diaspora or from indigenous tribal nations. The ceremonies and markers strive to recognize the histories of these groups, but it also aims to make clear that this is a history for the entire community, state, and nation. As has been pointed out in talks yesterday and today, this is everyone's history. This project is by no means the first or only to hold remembrance ceremonies. Part of what it is attempting to do, though, is to bring those who do not normally go to those events into the conversation. It's worth noting that the marker at Hollywood, Maryland, is at Sorterly Plantation, and was paid in large part by the descendants of the plantation's owners. And in Rhode Island, the descendant communities do include people who were involved in the trade, who own people. It's been a mixed, and it's also been an inspiring moment to see people from different backgrounds come together for this shared history. So. I'm going to show a few images from past ceremonies that the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project has helped to organize. So we have one from Jamestown, Virginia, and Baltimore, Maryland. More from Jamestown, St. Augustine, Florida. Um, the planning, again, we work with local committees to work forward. Um, it usually takes 12 to 18 months to organize and gather people for a ceremony sometimes for markers and designs, um, depending on the availability of locations or um, the desires for what type of design that can vary. So we have images from Pensacola, from Yorktown, Fredericksburg. Um, we had discussions with them, and the National Park Service, as in many sites, played a crucial role. And this is from our January meeting in Rhode, at Rhode Island Historical Society's Aldrich House. 
That was an initial discussion from which we were able to get many volunteers and community members. This summer, we had in Providence a larger community discussion where we brought in people who did not necessarily have to join a committee, but they could tell <laughs> us what they thought about this topic. And we had such a rich response of what a marker should look like, what a ceremony should be, where do we need to note this history. Um, and it's the amount of interest and a desire for this project has been remarkable. And that has been in large part because of the historical societies here, because of the local academics and just the locals who have a passion for this history, who have done so much research before us. So one of the things that we wish to emphasize is that the history of enslavement is local. It's entangled in multiple histories. Regardless of when someone enters that community, they become part of that history and have a responsibility to honor it. The history of enslavement is national. Not only is it about the recovery of the history of enslavement and the long history of black communities in areas such as New England, it's also about showing the interconnectedness of these local histories across um, the Eastern United States and into the Americas. The history of enslavement is global. The Rhode Island group is working, uh, working in Bristol, for example, has done so much work on the relationship between Bristol and Cuba. And we have looked into, the, and of course, it cannot be forgotten, this is not just a story of European empires, but of African nations and the African diaspora. So, thank you. A quick note on the ceremonies. While each group does tweak it to what it should be for that community, in general, what we encourage is permission, that it open with permission from a representative from a local tribal nation, recognizing that Europeans and Africans were not the first to arrive in the Americas, and especially in New England, it acknowledges that indigenous people are also descendants from Middle Passage survivors, um, as well as the fact that some people, such as the Pequot, were transported across the Atlantic. Permission is also asked from an elder of the African American community over the age of 100. <laughs> Historical statements are made, multiple religious faiths speak, representing not just the groups that were there during the period of enslavement, but those who represent the community today. Um, reinforcing ties to the African diaspora, children read the names of all current African countries, and there are librations, there is drumming throughout, and there's an emphasis on a shared history, but one that does talk about a black presence that matters, a black presence that has been there for a long time, and that is key for discussing what it means to have American history, what it means to have local history. So, in closing, um, and two more things. For the ceremonies, we do tell people you can have more than one ceremony. It can happen every year. <laughs> it can happen every two years. That this should be a moment of people coming together and having a conversation. And remembering and honoring the past cannot be solved in an afternoon. This should be a start. We often say that the mark and the ceremonies are not the beginning and they aren't the end. They're a step in an ongoing conversation. So I'm going to just close with <coughs> the images of our markers. And, sorry. If you are interested in the project, um, we do have a website, Middle Passage Markers. Uh, Middle Passage Markers at gmail.com is our email. We are now on Twitter. And for those of you locally, there is our, our Rhode Island Middle Passage website. We can also link to the Facebook group the tw as well as local sites as well. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's great. So my favorite three words, I was right. Um, the, the, the papers, the discussions were descriptions of these projects, um, brought up the issues of the local and the national and the global, and of the citizen historians who make these happen, citizen humanists who make these, these projects happen. Do you guys have anything you want to ask each other? While you're thinking, well, let's see what we've got in the audience. I will ask you if nobody else will. Is how are you? How are you gaining access to church cemeteries? Since I can help you with that, <laughs> at least here and and elsewhere. Um, I think it's been the same, whether it's a church cemetery or a community cemetery mm -hmm. or a family cemetery. 
Uh, people either have been finding out about the project and they just volunteer, you know, information. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of times if I'm told about a site and I'm interested in it, I call. I'm sorry. I call uh, and say, can I come by? <laughs> like I just like, um, and uh, yeah, I just ask people if they're willing to participate in this. Because it'd be worth asking denominations. I would think there would be a faster way to get you that access. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk afterwards. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anything else? Go. I'm just curious to find out. Um, can I call you Linda as well? Mm -hmm. All right. Where is the church that that where the activity will take place? I'm new to I. To About the six blocks that away. That away. Is that the right no. direction? That way. That away. Yeah. Down, <laughs> okay. down the hill. Not good at direction. If you go it's down the hill. Down the hill. Um, it's on North Main Street, right across from the Park Service building. <laughs> But, okay. but you're, you're, on the, you're on the top of it. You're, if you come out of the building, come I'll be out happy the building, to take you to the cathedral. Take a left, take a right, you go down the hill, and you, you, you'll hit North Main Street, and you take a right. So it's fine down the hill is always the, the yeah. answer from here. Good question, because we were um, at, the, what, what is it called, where the university is? Student Hill, University Hill? College Hill. College, College Hill. Hill. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw an enormous cathedral, and I'm just wondering if that's it. No. No, uh, no. no that's, the, that's the First Baptist Church. Okay. Right. <laughs> also an historic institution. Yes. It's not the First Baptist Church of Providence. It's the First, First Baptist, Baptist Church. Baptist Church. <laughs> right. I don't know a lot about churches, but I know that. Right? <laughs> well, that's a good one. Yeah. You had somewhere I have a question for Sandra. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Um, so I wanted to get more information on how you're creating sort of the national aspect of this database mm -hmm. and the difficulty you have in, in doing that. Um, you said that you are, didn't have any funding, but now you have some funding. So how are you kind of really accomplishing that and what have been some of the major challenges that you've encountered during that process? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, well. Um, I guess right now the the status of the project is um, we're trying to shape, or I'm trying to find a way to, to shape a really great public engagement component for the database. I think um, to to create a national database, uh, again, uh, the public has to be almost like a permanent partner. It's uh, the public engagement component is like crucial. So I think um, the challenge for me is finding a way to uh, keep the public engaged in documenting the sites, you know, past a period of time. So if we did a public outreach initiative right now, um, or doing Black History Month or, or something, uh, people would be interested, and I'm sure they would they would help. But we want people to be engaged um, five, ten, fifteen years from now when they find the sites. You know, uh, we want people to uh, to help us document them. So. Um, so as a follow-up follow to that, then to keep the public engaged, are you looking to maybe make the site um, more interactive in a sense exactly. where they can like upload exactly. stuff as they find it, yeah. categorize exactly. it and all exactly. that? Okay. It's, it's being designed in such a way, in, in that way exactly, where um, people can submit information as they find the sites, but then you can also go in and do searches. So, um, but the challenge that also we're, that I'm kind of uh, faced with that is, you know, uh, a verification process of, of sites and, and how do we uh, kind of uh, divide the information and, and, and what to make public, what not to make public, because um, a lot of the sites are on private property mm -hmm. and there are people that want to help, they've expressed that they want to help and uh, they've submitted information to the project, um, but they're reluctant to, uh, to have that made public because uh, people could come on their property and things like that. So, so it's just trying to find a way to, uh, to work out a really good plan, so. There's somebody in the back, yeah. So I have a question for Emily. I was fascinated to hear you say something about solderly plantation because yeah. it's sort of off the beaten path. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that site and the process of putting a marker there, because we, you talked a lot about ports, but Soderley is, <laughs> I guess, a site that is not a port. Like, so there are markers in Annapolis, but Soderley seems more like a, a, just a spot, perhaps indicative of a lot of the early trade. Right, no, I think that that's a really great 
example. So I will start with a brief caveat that Sauterly was done right before I came on with the project. So the ins and outs of what exactly happened, um, I can put you in contact with people for that. But Sauterly is on a waterway. And I think when we think about ports today, we think about very big spaces with a lot of industry happening, but that's not every port. Um, Sauterly is documented. They do have records of, of Middle Passage survivors arriving there. And for me, what I find fascinating about sites like that is you realize, as you go back in history, the places we view as important or central weren't always so, and some places that now seem off the beaten track were deeply ingrained in a global enterprise. They were a major part of the world. And I think it shifts our sense of which places are important for history, but it's also about which histories are crucial for understanding where we are today. But oh, and if you go to our website or our Facebook site, you can see more images and maybe some video of Sauterly, <laughs> so um, please do so. Uh, yes, this is for Sandra. Can you talk a little bit more? I thought your point about the uh, recognizing the humanity by restoring the uh, cemeteries and burying grounds. Can you talk a little bit about your thinking or the thinking of you and your partners in terms of how that might come about? Who you think is, could it, who would be responsible or should be responsible? And what, uh, what reactions have been? I, I speak of this partly from a town where it took us a while to get a, uh, a plaque up that says there are slaves buried in the historic cemetery in that town. It was a real fight in that town. Not a fight, but you know, it was challenging, put it mm -hmm. that way. And so now the question is the restoration, uh, identifying specifically in the cemetery where those markers are. Does the town have some responsibility? Is the state, federal, that type of thing? What are your ideas about that? I know you limited in terms of your capacity. So more your ideas and thinking and ideas and thinking of others you work with. Um, I, I guess, uh, my uh, thoughts about that are, I think it, a cemetery, a burial ground is just a sacred space. And I think uh, in the work that I've done, my experience has been with the people that have uh, submitted information to the project and people that I've spoken to and people that I've met, uh, whether they be descendants of enslaved people, descendants of enslaved of people who enslaved people, uh, regardless of who they are. There's something about, um, and again, I don't want to be simplistic, but this, uh, there's something about humanity that just connects people. And I've um, seen situations where um, you know, there's a little bit of pushback in a community or in a town or in a, uh, uh, mo most, mostly, I would say a town. Well, actually, town and also on property. Uh, people who uh, uh, who have there's a burial ground, let's say, on someone's property, and um, there are members of the family that don't necessarily, you know, they don't want to necessarily recognize that slaves are buried there. But then there are other members of the family that do. And I think what has um, kind of eased the uh, um, the the hardship of that is um, just really recognizing uh, enslaved people as people. And so I don't, I don't really think there's a really a complicated, you know, it's, it, to me. I think it's more the restoration, like that East End Cemetery mm -hmm. in Richmond. Oh, I see. Well, that's a good example. The gentleman who actually is leading the efforts to that is um, a person who's not a descendant of enslaved. He's not African, he's not African American, he just, cared about the site because these, these are people. And they're, they're people and their resting places should be sacred. So he started this entire initiative where he gathered up the community of people of all backgrounds are now coming together to, uh, to restore the site. So I, I, I guess um, it's really, as far as uh, actual efforts to restore a site, it's relative, obviously, to the community, to the town, to, to, work, to wherever the site is. Um, like, for example, I'll use my family as an example. The site that I showed you, um, that's not on my family's property. We don't own it. 
you know, and the people that own it are the descendants of the people who owned my family. So um, we've been able to work with them. It's been very, you know, it hasn't been comfortable at times, you know, but, but it's, it's been pleasant. But the person that started that was my aunt uh, and following, you know, her example. But I think the more we all kind of worked together and we talked and we listened to one another, uh, we saw our common humanity, and now we were able to take care of the cemetery basically together. Uh, because before I got involved with the cemetery, um, she would take care of it, and then they would, they would take care of it. But they weren't working together, and we're all in the same cemetery. So I didn't understand why we just can't work together. Uh, and, and what was making it difficult is that we just, people just weren't facing the big elephant in the living room, which was the space that was dividing the two sides. Slavery, you know. And so once we were able to kind of like face that and have that dialogue, it wasn't, they saw the people buried in the empty spot as people. And um, so, you were lucky. Over here, yeah. I, uh, well, thanks. Thanks very much to all three of you. They're all really inspiring uh, projects. My question, though, again, is for Sandra because I'm <laughs> also very interested in cemeteries. Um, so my question is about all the cemeteries, the African American cemeteries that have been lost and destroyed and that are no longer recoverable. Um, the African burial ground is a wonderful example of one that that came back you know, mm -hmm. into the world of the living. But so many uh, of the um, historically African-American cemeteries have been destroyed by um, transportation projects, uh, by urban renewal, by other, by other forces. Uh, for example, in Pittsburgh, where, where I teach, uh, the major African-American cemetery in, in the city was destroyed actually for the first public housing project in the state of Pennsylvania in the, in the late 1930s under FDR's administration. Um, and this was a, a, a cemetery that had civil war, black civil war veterans, large numbers of them buried there. And I'm sure people who had been born into slavery were there. Um, so I guess the, so I'm wondering if there is any way that this, that your project could somehow imaginatively include or include information about lost cemeteries, cemeteries mm -hmm. that no longer exist right. where it's probably not possible to retrieve bodies. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's actually a, a very excellent uh, point and suggestion because I think one of the things that I, I'm hoping that the site will be, uh, that it won't just be um, a site where people come and uh, I guess do uh, research on burial grounds, but we want the site to be a site that engages people in the entire public memory of enslaved Americans. So providing um, information for people to get resources on how to restore a site, all the different questions that I talked about that people were having. Um, a lot of the questions um, when people came to me, it actually, um, it turned out that there are resources out there to help people, but they just, the community just weren't aware of of what to do. But I think um, in the case of like, a ban like the forgotten sites, um, I think, um, yeah, I think that would be an excellent uh, section to have on, on the, the, the database. Um, because I think as sites come in to the project, again, this hasn't been made public public, but the information that is coming in, I mean, I'm learning new things all, all the time, you know. Um, the, uh, about where sites are located, where slavery existed, you know. Um, I mean, obviously we know it didn't just exist in the South, and, and, um, but you know, we've gotten sites from out West. Um, we've gotten sites from, um, yeah, out West, a lot of Native American burials, you know, Native Americans that were enslaved. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that the site will be uh, kind of a really engaging educational tool for people and, and the public memory of slavery. So I think having information on lost burial grounds and having information on, on that would be great. So, Will you join me in thanking the speakers for a terrific panel?